Well, Canada, of course, you know, is one of the most multicultural nations in the entire world. We have represented within our borders over 200 ethnic origins. That's something, isn't it, when you think about it? Even in our small community, this community of Ridgetown in the, in the immediate area, we have, let's say, England represented. We have Ireland. Any Irish here? Fighting Irish. Couple there. Scotland. I know Janice got a couple. Yes. Scotland. Holland. All right. Santa's Dutch. I didn't know that. <laughs> Let's learn something. Poland. No. What is it? Ukraine. Ukraine. A little of both, all right. Um, Ghana, Nigeria, any countries I've missed here? Malta. What's that? Malta. Malta. Oh, Maltese. I like those chocolates that you make. <laughs> <laughs> any, anyone else? France. France. We have some France people from France here. Their origins? Yeah. Our, can our country has abundant resources. We know we have the largest supply of fresh water. We have timber, oil, and metals. We're famous for our beavers, uh, our hockey players, the blue nose. Anybody ever sailed on the blue nose? My wife and I play one on our honeymoon. We had to say, isn't that a great memory? Did you get a high wind? We were flying. Oh, I just didn't want to tan. Tim Hortons? We have Tim Hortons. Anybody ever gone to Tim Hortons? I know I really wanted one this morning, but Shannon, I don't know what happened to her. <laughs> I'm teasing you, Shannon. The formation of Canada was not without some struggle. We know that there were people that we refer to as First Nations that were here long before anyone with white skin ever arrived. In 1534, uh, Jacques Cartier looked at Newfoundland and said, I'm inclined to believe that this is the land that God gave Cain. Oh. He saw it as a hard and unforgiving land. But the First Nations people demonstrated to the Europeans that it's a land that you could survive on and you could, you could endure. And so the Europeans came, and it's not something we're proud of, but muskets were more powerful than arrows and tomahawks. And so the Europeans kept coming, didn't they? In 1759, the French and the English clashed on the plains of Abraham. 1812, we were at war with the United States within two years. A um, country which we now know as Canada prevailed. We were outnumbered and outgunned. Nevertheless, we did win. In 1914, Canada would now do its part in fighting Germany. In 1917, we would take our turn in the assault on Vimy Ridge. 3,600 men lost their lives there but it was a moment of Canadian identity. In 1939, we stepped into war again in support of Britain. World War II, more than a million Canadians served. In 1972, a most unusual combat was played out against Russia on the hockey rink. Game number seven, to the chance of net net Soviet, da da Canada, Henderson scored and we emerged victorious. How many of you remember where you were when that happened? I played sick and stayed home to watch the game. Oh. <laughs> what are my priorities? Long before those epic battles, David Thompson, one of the great explorers, tracked over 50,000 square kilometers to map out and expand the west. And so we were becoming a country from sea to sea. On July 1st, 1867, we became a nation, and as I indicated earlier, one of the founding fathers of the Confederation, Leonard Tilley, who was a former premier of New Brunswick, he was reading his Bible one day, he read it, Psalm 72, verse 8, he shall have dominion also from sea to sea. He took that back to the fathers, and they agreed that that should play into the new name of our country, the Dominion of Canada. We've given the world 22 Nobel Prize winners. The concept of peacekeeping, Michael Buble. As a country formed by peoples of nations from the whole world, we have chosen an identity that welcomes the stranger, an identity of diversity so that everyone can call Canada their home, and an identity of tolerance so that even when we disagree, 
we still can live at peace amongst each other in mutual respect. This is Canada. Are you proud to be a Canadian? Amen. So the question I would like to answer this morning is, where does the church, you and I, the followers of Jesus Christ, fit into this country? What's our place? I don't expect to talk too long. I mean, we want to get outside for our photo. But I do want to say something that is meaningful that perhaps you haven't realized in terms of the fullness of your identity in Christ and our collective identity together. The red letters, no reason to step away from them. John 8, where we've been the last two Sundays, we return there, Jesus saying, I am the light of the world, echoes back to when he told us in Matthew 5 that you, I, are the light of the world as well. Christ in us, we become lights. Not just mirrors, but we become lights ourselves. And yet that's not the end of it, we discover. There's three biblical concepts I want to weave together to help you understand your identity. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, we are told that Jesus is walking amongst the seven lampstands, and the seven lampstands are the churches. The local churches are metaphorically referred to in Scripture as lampstands. Seven golden lampstands. We here at the gathering place are metaph metaphorically defined or described as a lampstand. And the point being is that in a world made with God's creative beauty and splendor, and it is wondrous, it is majestic, still, it is spiritually dark. <laughs> and in that darkness, there are followers of Jesus who are lights. And the followers of Jesus dispel the darkness. Collectively, we are lamps. If you think of a menorah as a lamp with many lights, collectively, we are lamps. The gathered place, the community church of which we are part, is a lamp in Ridgetown. And what we must understand by all these references to, to Jesus being the light, us being the light, and lampstands, is that if there is no light, there can only be darkness. Darkness fills in where there's an absence of light. Without you and I in Canada and others who are followers of Jesus, there is darkness. But there's more to it than that. Have you ever used your weight to try to push something back? Imagine you, you, a door is stuck in the jam and, and you're pushing on it. And, you, and, and so there's the weight, your, your body weight, and it's translated into a, a pushing force. And then all of a sudden the door gives way. What happens? You fall in faith. You fall through. If Ron Little and I are pushing against each other and clearly we're matched in strength. <laughs> <laughs> and I step aside, Ron's all of a sudden going to go forward because his weight and the force of energy pushes him forward. Now we bring these ideas together. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, that you and I are weighted down by the glory of God. The weight of God's glory. Now whenever in Scripture you read the word glory, like the glory of the Lord shone around, it's always equated with light, God's light. All right? And so, what we understand by bringing these scriptures together is that we are lights, but we are weighted lights. And in terms of darkness, the weighted lights and the darkness are pushing against each other. And the weighted lights are actually forcing back, pushing back the darkness. But if we step away, what happens? The darkness fills in. But there's one more thought to weave in with this. There is coming a day, so the Bible says, that those who are alive, those who are dead in Christ, will be caught up in the air with those who are alive in Christ, and we will be raptured. There is a day coming, the second coming of the Lord, when the lights, the followers of Jesus, are removed. And the Holy Spirit is at the same moment removed from the face of the earth. And what follows is a tribulation. 
It says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until a rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man due to destruction. And it goes on to talk about how the restrainer is holding this, this human embodiment of darkness back. So we all know that Lucifer in the Bible is the prince of darkness. But in human form, there's an emissary that comes called Antichrist, the Antichristos. He will be a human emissary. And he cannot step onto the face of the earth until the restrainer, the Holy Spirit, is removed and you and I, as the lights, the weighted lights are removed. So what happens at that moment when we are removed? The darkness just fills in. You see? And that's the tribulation. God begins to judge the earth. Hell on earth, if you will. Now I tell you this, so that you in this present world can fully comprehend your identity in Christ. And what we are called to do in this nation and in this world. We are called to shine. But more than that, we are not only holding back the darkness. We are increasing the light. You're not just the average person. You're a child of God. Jesus is the light of the world. With Jesus in you, you are the light of the world. And you are a weighted light. You and I make that much of a difference. You are not inanimate, but you are weighted. And we push the darkness back until the Lord comes again. Okay, but how? I always have in my notes, YBH. Yes, but how? It's all good here, but practical. Well, we pray. We don't understand as a general rule, the significance and the necessity of prayer. We collaborate with God when we pray. God will not involve himself in our work unless we make the connection. That's prayer. We are collaborators. And so when we pray, God begins to move. And we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, that we ought to be making petitions and prayers and intercession and thanksgiving for everyone, but especially for kings and prime ministers and presidents and authority, that we might live peaceful and quiet lives in all goodliness, godliness, and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to, to come to a knowledge of the truth. If the darkness is prevailing, it is simply because the lights aren't shining and pushing back. Do you understand? You're not, in a, you're not neutral. You are a weighted light. Hebrews 20, first of all, secondly, Jesus talked about in preparation for his coming that we need to keep our lamps trimmed and burning. You need to keep yourself shining. How do you do that? Pastor, I, I really don't believe that I need to go to church in order to be a Christian. I could find God in nature and that. And I go, yeah. But you aren't going to survive. Because iron sharpens iron. And you need to keep your lamp trimmed and burning. And this is, this is what we do with each other. We rub off it. We encourage one another. And God is present more in the collective gathering than he is individual. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. And so it says in Hebrews 10.25, Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. As the manner of some, but keep coming together as the day approaches. You need to do that in order to keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Look at your barbecue. Remember the well, not gas barbecue? Anybody still use coals? I know, Matthew, I need to get with the times, right? But if you have a, a, a coal barbecue and you they're 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 hot and they're and they're and they're and and, and they're shining, they're they're brilliant with light. If you take one away from the rest, what happens? It loses its heat and it loses its light rapidly. But when they're in, in connection with the others, 
It sustains that heat and, and precipitates that light. So it is with the family of Christ. And so thirdly, we need to get out of the salt shaker. You know, changing metaphors, not only are we the light of the world, we're the salt of the earth. And we need to get out of the salt shaker. Jesus would pray to his father just prior to his death that you and I would be in the world but not of the world. In other words, if your only interaction with people during the week is in church on Sunday, you've missed the point. You're supposed to shine in dark places. You need to be involved in community events, whether it's volunteering with the fire department or in a league of some kind, lawn bowling, doesn't matter. You need to be involved in something where your, your light can shine. You don't even need to understand how it shines. Your presence is the presence of Christ in that place. And so to be involved, Billy Graham, I still like Billy Graham. Christians, he said, are like the Gulf Stream. This is so cool. Which is in the ocean, and yet it's not part of it. This mysterious current defies the mighty Atlantic. It ignores its tides and flows steadily upon its course. Its color is different, being deeper blue. Its temperature is different, being warmer. Its direction is different, being from the south to the north. It is in the ocean, and yet it's not part of it. He says, so we as Christians are in the world. We come into contact with the world, and yet we retain our distinctive kingdom character and refuse to let the world press us into the mold. We are weighted lights. And so on Canada Day, or Canada Day weekend, by example and courage with grace and love, we are called to dispel the darkness so that the light of Christ can shine. This is who we are, and this is who we were meant to be in Canada and around the world. You are the light of Christ. Shine with intention. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you again for the freedom to be here today and to hear your word and help us to be attention as weighted lights who push back darkness and hold back the coming of the evil one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.